Kira Kato, Ko John Edwards Tine, Te Mana, Matapono, Mata Tapu. Uh, I'm John Edwards. I am the Privacy Commissioner of New Zealand. Uh, those of you who've attended my events know that if it says we're starting at 1.30, we're starting at 1.30. And snipers are deployed for questioners who go on too long. Uh, but we won't have any of that because we have um, actually a fabulous um, uh, mechanism for submitting questions and voting on them. It's called Ask Vote. Do we have a slide for Ask Vote? It's there? Oh, yeah. So if you have a device, go to this URL and find our event, which is Privacy Forum, and submit a question. This means that, uh, or if you see a question that you like, you can upvote it. This is to assist the chairs uh, to know what is the most popular questions. So we don't just take the most insistent questioner, we take the most popular question. A very warm welcome to everybody. Um, thanks so much for coming. We've had a fantastic few days of um, privacy talk, and you know how thrilling uh, that is. It's been a, a unique event for us because we've been able to combine uh, two separate international meetings. The International Working Group on Data Protection and Telecommunications uh, has been meeting for 35 years. It's known as the Berlin Group. Uh, it has that name because the Secretariat functions and all the organisation and logistics is organised by uh, the Office of the Berlin Data Protection Commissioner. And we were very pleased last week to host the uh, Berlin Group uh, in Queenstown. What that means is that we have access to data protection authorities and industry specialists and academics from all over the world uh, who have that particular technical and telecommunications bent. Uh, that shouldered up with APA, which is the Asia Pacific Privacy Authorities. Uh, and Asia Pacific Privacy Authorities have been uh, meeting for 25 years. We just had the 50th uh, meeting uh, concluded this morning of APA. Uh, and we've been able to take advantage of these two events to have representation to present to you uh, from all around the world. Um, and uh, it's, it's unprecedented for us in New Zealand and it's, um, it's a real thrill. Uh, I have to keep my comments short because you didn't come here to see me. You can hear me all the time. So I'm just going to restrict myself to the housekeeping elements. Uh, safety, emergency, and toilets. Um, be safe. If there's an emergency, um, assemble outside on Gray Street. The toilets are to the right as you go out. If there's an earthquake, stop, drop, and hold, whatever you can find to hold, uh, and, and don't do anything until the shaking stops. Uh, we have uh, Wi-Fi, IC, public wireless is the connection. Uh, on the home page, that should pop up. Now, um, select the visitor tab and enter the password uh, December or DEC18. Please uh, jump onto the Ask Vote. If you want to um, ask Commissioner Denham a question or any of our speakers today, uh, register it up there, and the chairs will uh, have access to that, uh, and uh, we'll see if you're question wins. Um, Panellists, can I address you please? Uh, ten minutes. We're running a tight ship. We've got a lot of speakers to get through. Uh, so I'd be very grateful if ten minutes before your session uh, is due, you could go to the tech desk in the back corner uh, and uh, get mic'd up. I've got half a dozen seats at the front here. There's a few spots in the middle. Please come in. Nobody needs to stand. There should be uh, enough seats. Um, if my staff want to hang back for mic jockeying purposes, then uh, you do so with my gratitude. Uh, well, that's all the introductory remarks I care to make. Um, you can ask questions of me as well through Ask Vote, but I now have the great pleasure of introducing uh, the United Kingdom uh, Information Commissioner, Elizabeth Denham. Uh, Liz is well known to the APA community because of her provenance, uh, through the uh, Office of the Privacy Commissioner in Canada, where she was Deputy Commissioner. She moved from there to become uh, Information Commissioner in British Columbia. That's where she added the FOIA uh, aspect to her career, which will become important in a moment. Uh, and from the British Columbia Office, uh, which now hosts the APA Secretariat, you see all the links developing here, um, 
she's moved to the uh, Information Commissioner's office in uh, the UK, where she runs an office of 700 people, uh, boots down the door of organisations like Cambridge Analytica, uh, as well as administers um, uh, a whole range of data protection and freedom of information functions. Um, Elizabeth Denham has a serious talk, she tells me. So let's, let's hear it. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you so much to John for inviting me to New Zealand for this meeting. And congratulations to APA on the 50th anniversary. It's fantastic. So yes, um, everybody's had lunch, right? This is a very serious talk. So I'm going to be scanning the audience and making sure that your eyes are open. I'll catch you out if they're not. Um, and I will be able to take some questions at the end. So hopefully you will have some challenging ones. And if it gets into detailed Brexit questions, then my good colleague James Dipple Johnston is going to be on the panel um, on the next uh, slot, and he'll take them all. I'm a long way from my front door. Actually, I'm a long way from the front door in my house in my adopted country. But somehow I feel right at home here, and John has explained the links that I have personally with APA and with this community. And I have fond memories of hosting APA in Vancouver. I'm a frequent flyer. Once a month, I travel to Brussels to sit on the European Data Protection Board with regulators from 27 countries. And the European Data Protection Board is the independent body that's set up to ensure consistency in enforcement and policy work and oversight of the general data protection regulation. And over the past year, I've spoken at a lot of events in the Northern Hemisphere, but it's rare that I make it this far south. During this trip, I'm also talking to fellow regulators in the Asia Pacific region. On my way to this APA meeting, I stopped over in Hong Kong to spend some time with Commissioner Wong in his office, and they are really out in front in terms of thought leadership on digital ethics and accountability. And I'm delighted to be back in New Zealand to talk to regulators, businesses, and the media here. I will then move on to India, where I'm meeting with ministers and the tech industries in that emerging powerhouse. As commissioner in the UK, I'm one of the members of the European Data Protection Board, but the ICO's international imprint goes much deeper than Europe. The ICO is co-chair of the Common Thread Network that links up data protection authorities in Commonwealth nations, and that network promotes cross-border cooperation and building capacity by sharing knowledge on emerging trends, model laws, and best practices for data protection. And I was recently elected chair of the International Conference of Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners, the ICD-PPC, following, following in the footsteps of my colleague and friend John Edwards and Isabel falk pierre the French commissioner. The ICD PPC is truly a unique global forum encompassing more than 120 independent data protection authorities across all continents. And it champions strong and independent authorities and ensures that we can share cutting edge policy and enforcement experience. Several of my ICD PPC executive, commissioner, executive committee commissioner colleagues are here today, 
We have Raymond from the Philippines, Marguerite from Burkina Faso, and Angeline from Australia. So we almost have quorum to have an executive committee meeting right after this session. What do you think, Raymond? So I'm very keen to ensure that the ICD-PPC supports member authorities with best practices, with strategies that are inclusive of the diverse legal frameworks and inclusive of different cultural backgrounds. So I'm finding this trip to the Asia Pacific particularly enlightening from a cross-cultural perspective. And what I'm seeing here are different approaches to privacy-friendly innovation that are culturally specific and reflect the values of those jurisdictions. But the ties that bind us are strong data protection laws and strong data protection regulators. And in the age of borderless data flows, there has never been a more important time for global coherence in data protection and privacy. So let's, let's have a think about global data protection standards. The new European regulation, the GDPR, has a global pedigree. Regulatory instruments and practices that were developed elsewhere in the world are embedded in the DNA during its drafting. So we in the EU made vigorous efforts to learn from abroad and embrace the policy instruments that were pioneered in other countries. Data breach notification, fair information practices originated in the US. Accountability and privacy by design in Canada. Codes of practice, UK and New Zealand. And innovative measures from East Asia. So I think the Europeans took the best in breed to create the best in show. So the movement towards global convergence is nothing new. And if you look at the broad history of privacy and data protection over the last 40 years, there's been a general convergence of understanding of what it means for an organization to process personal data responsibly. And there is also a general agreement about the rights that individuals should have to protect their data. So this has been, and it is, a complex process of networking involving the give and take from the global community. There has been a matching up of standards, of course, guidelines and conventions, and most notably, the GDPR. And these approaches have had an impact on jurisdictions that have been later adopters of national data protection laws. So the more people that you have in the data protection club, the greater the clamor there is for others to join and to make their data protection laws align to existing international approaches. From my perspective, it appears to be a race to the top when it comes to data protection standards globally. And now, some aspects of the GDPR appear to be leading the race. That is not to say that there needs to be a cut and paste of the GDPR as a solution for everyone. It's fit for purpose in Europe, but that doesn't mean that it's fit for purpose the world over. Each nation's constitution, its culture, its legal framework, and its trading relationships play an important role when it comes to data protection. And those differences must be acknowledged and they must be respected. So as a law, 
I probably don't have to tell anyone in this room, especially businesses from New Zealand, that it isn't perfect. But it is a catalyst for law reform outside of Europe. So take what's happening here in New Zealand with the draft bill for an enhanced privacy law. John, yours is a 25-year-old law, and when it was drafted in the 1990s, nobody foresaw the social media ecosystem, AI, machine learning, and individuals' desire for data portability. There's nothing like a new law to focus consumer and citizen attention on their rights. And that's certainly our experience in the UK when it's come to the introduction of the GDPR. So it's just over six months since the new law came into effect across, across Europe, bringing with it greater accountability, greater transparency, and greater user control. And as we planned, as we thought, I'm seeing more of everything in the UK. More complaints from the public, from 9,000 to 19,000 in a comparable six-month period. Complaints about subject access, about data security, about data portability. All of our frontline services have jumped a minimum of 100%. More breach reports, 8,000 since May 25th, when it became mandatory to report in certain high-risk situations. More stakeholder engagement, as we work closely with organizations to advise on privacy risks up front. We're really fortunate that we can do all this because the UK Parliament has given us an updated fee regime, giving us control and certainty around our own funding. So our, our head count is 60% higher than, than it was in 2016 when I took on the role. The ICO's Deputy Commissioner, James Dipple Johnston, where's James, front, will be giving more detail about our GDPR experience so far when he speaks on the next panel. One thing that I know for sure is that we're going to look back on this time. We're going to look back in 2018 as pivotal in public awareness. And I think the moment when people sat up and took notice of the potential of their personal information. Privacy and data security have gone mainstream. And it's not just because of the GDPR. Cyber attacks affecting millions or hundreds of millions of people and more. Invisible profiling, micro-targeting techniques in elections, opaque AI. All of these things have increased people's concerns. I flew here on Cafe Pacific. It was very nice. But whenever I opened a search bar to look at the website, my results page overflowed with articles about their major breach in September affecting 9 million people. People are talking about it. People are writing about it. People are angry, and they're concerned about it. So this breach has legs. And that translates to business impact. Because as people become more aware, they expect and they demand greater safeguards and greater control over their personal data. The ICO's own research tells us that only one in three UK adults have trust in organizations that process their data. That's a bit better than it was but it's still not good enough. Businesses that embrace a commitment to strong data protection will be the ones that are going to flourish. Given that personal data is the prime asset in the fourth industrial re revolution, 
our citizens expect the security of their information and privacy as part of the services they access or buy. So trust in this space is hard won, but it's easily lost. Another key driver for improvement is mandatory reporting of data breach incidents. And I know this is, this is being considered as part of the current update in the New Zealand law. As I've mentioned, the ICO has received more than 8,000 8, data breach notices since May 25th, and it is one of the areas that concerns businesses most, and rightly so, because data breach reporting is not just an administrative responsibility. It speaks to the accountability principle in the GDPR, and the accountability principle requires you to take responsibility for what you do with personal data and that you have processes and systems in place to demonstrate this compliance. So if within the 72 hour time limit, a UK organization has no idea as to the who or the what or the why of a breach, then it's clear to us that they don't have the required accountability data checks and balances in place, as is required in law. So I believe that data breach reporting drives companies to better invest in data security and data protection. So for this reason, I think mandatory reporting is one of the most significant upgrades to the law. And the ICO has had an upgrade too. The GDPR brings data protection law into the digital age, and it's imperative that as a regulator, we're fit for purpose too. After the madness of drafting all the GDPR compliance, the ICO is moving into a different phase where we engage with UK businesses and citizens in a more collaborative and circular way. We're investing heavily in technical roles. We have a new deputy commissioner who's responsible for innovation and tech. We have an AI fellow who's going to develop a framework for auditing algorithms. We have an external expert panel for tech and an expanded intelligence hub. And our, one of the focuses for this year is on digital ethics and internet harms. And I know that I'm gonna find the details of the work done on ethical impact assessments by the Hong Kong Commissioner to be a key input into the ICO's work. We're moving ahead quickly with our own regulatory sandbox, which is a safe space for companies to beta test their ideas, their services, their business models. And again, that's a recognition of the circular rather than the linear nature of the development process. And we're taking lessons on sandbox from our colleagues in Singapore who are ahead of us in this space. So all of these new developments are part of a wider trend at the ICO towards ever greater innovation domestically and internationally. But the big question and the elephant in the room is, what does the GDPR mean for New Zealand or any non-EU jurisdiction? And so how many, how many New Zealand businesses do we have in the room? There's a few, you've got questions, don't you? And legal advisors to businesses. We have some people here. Yeah, okay. If your business has an establishment in the EU where personal information is processed, or if you're offering goods and services, or you're monitoring the behavior of residents in the EU, then you're caught by the GDPR. That's simple, right? 
you have to comply with all of the provisions of the GDPR in relation to processing EU residents' data. The first <coughs> important message is <coughs> don't panic. If you're already following good data protection practices for your customers, then you're already a good part of the way there. <coughs> My office has provided tools, thanks James, <coughs> to guide biz businesses in their compliance work for the GDPR, including checklists so that you can assure yourself of the key points in our thinking. Thanks very much. And generally, you will know if you're caught by the GDPR because you will be explicitly directing services to EU residents. And it's not just because your website happens to be accessible in the EU. So if you just take one example, a Wellington real retailer who's offering products available online with payments to be made in British pounds, processing several orders a day for, for individuals from individuals in the UK, and making it easy to ship <coughs> products to them. So that retailer will be subject to the GDPR, and that retailer will be subject to the oversight of the ICO. There actually, there's more pragmatic advice and details on targeting and monitoring criteria in the EDPB draft guidelines on extraterritorial reach. But the main point of departure from the previous law to the current law is that the GDPR is focused on where people are rather than where the equipment involved in the data processing is located. Okay. We got that down, right? So what does that extraterritorial reach really mean to New Zealand businesses in practice? It means thinking about privacy at the design stage. Privacy by design, data protection impact assessments, and data minimization. It also means having a plan in place of how your business is going to respond to EU residents who want to exercise their rights, including the right to erasure, the right to rectification, the right to data portability. It also means determining whether you need a representative in the EU. And bear this in mind, you need to trust that this, represent, this representative can convey on your behalf that you are evidencing compliance with the rules, including reporting to the local data protection regulator in the EU. Remember, though, when it comes to enforcement action, <coughs> proportionality is embedded in the GDPR. And EU data protection regulators have a whole range of tools available in our toolkits. So we're going to prioritize our enforcement activities towards the bad actors who are a direct threat to EU residents. Companies outside of the EU that are trying their best to comply with the law and those that are engaging with EU regulators can expect to engage the advisory, the warning scope of our powers rather than the 4% global turnover fine. OK, now it's time for a word on Brexit. Not many of my audiences and meetings go by without a word on Brexit. It was the topic of conversation over dinner last night. What can I say as a transplanted Canadian on the front lines of probably the biggest political debate since the Second World War. It's easy. These are, these are extraordinary times in the UK as the UK redefines its relationship 
with the EU after a 40-year marriage. There's no blueprint for this. And I have to say that things feel pretty bumpy at the moment. There are still many unknowns about the final arrangements, but I think one thing that's clear and has been clear from the outset is that the, the UK and the EU understand the importance of data protection. And in July of 2016, when I just arrived in the UK, and this was a couple of weeks after the referendum vote, we sat in the office and we thought, how important is data protection going to be in the divorce negotiations? Is it going to be, it's one of 50 policy areas with fisheries and immigration and aviation and medicines and chemicals. Where's data protection going to be? And how are we going to get the attention of the politicians to focus on data? However, data protection became one of the three key areas for debate and focus at the end of the day. The UK and the EU understand the importance of data protection. And this is reflected in the UK government's position paper. It's reflected in the withdrawal agreement. And it's also included in the political declaration on the future of the UK-EU relationship. I don't think I have to tell anyone in this room that personal data underpins the digital economy, it underpins security cooperation, and it underpins public services. And being here in Wellington, I realize the depth of the cultural, social, familial, and professional links between the UK and New Zealand. And they're similarly deep and cherished as a relationship between the UK and our European neighbors. And that's why, on most days, I'm confident that the end of the, at the end of the day, a way through will be found to make sure that data can continue to flow and that high standards of data protection will be preserved. And ultimately, the future relationship is one for the politicians. But whatever happens, the UK government has committed to retaining the GDPR and retaining a strong, independent, well-resourced regulator. We expect that our work with our EU colleagues will continue on international enforcement cooperation. We share their values, and we have good, constructive relationships. And now, a word on our Cambridge Analytica Facebook investigation. And I'm sure there'll be some questions about that as well. This is truly an international file with around 50 countries affected by the harvesting of their citizens' profile data by an app developer and shared with Cambridge Analytica for political purposes. The ICO has issued civil penalties. We are pursuing criminal prosecution of Cambridge Analytica, and our investigation continues. We're presently working through a massive trove of evidence seized from the company and elsewhere. We have 700 terabytes of data, and that's equivalent to 52 billion pages. And this data affects citizens from most of the countries represented in this, in this room. We're cooperating with our regulatory colleagues. We're cooperating with law enforcement agencies in the UK, in the US, to ensure that our citizens are safe and protected, and also to ensure that lessons are learned to protect the integrity of our democratic processes. The world is getting smaller. 
And wherever in, people are in the world, from Australia, Argentina, Bermuda, Burkina Faso, people are concerned about what happens to their data. And in the UK, as in New Zealand, data protection is embedded in our culture. It's been in UK domestic law for over 30 years, and people expect their personal data to be handled in line with the law, and when it's not, they expect a strong regulator has their back. But we really do live in uncertain and bumpy times. There's a lot of knee-jerk reaction to specific events. And our collective drive towards coherent privacy standards can be driven off course by unanticipated political or judicial events. But we have to keep our eyes focused on the long term. So how do I see the future? I think lawmakers will be influenced by other jurisdictions when their citizens come to them wondering why they don't enjoy the same privacy rights as people across a border or people across an ocean. And I think people can be pretty persuasive when it comes to politics. I also think that there's going to be a continuing convergence in our laws and our practices. And this convergence is speeding up. Just last week in Westminster, there was an unprecedented grand committee of parliamentarians from nine jurisdictions, including Singapore, Argentina, Brazil, Ireland, Canada. And that grand committee heard from witnesses on electoral interference and internet harms. There is political will to find, out, to find joined up solutions to citizens' challenges. And in the medium term, I have renewed hope for interoperability, particularly through the efforts of many of the data protection authorities in this room. And as chair of the ICD PPC, I will work with my APA colleagues and with other members around the world to find pragmatic links and bridges between various accountability and standards regimes. At the end of the day, this is all about people. Data is increasingly internationalized. And we can't let the protection of individuals fall between the cracks of different regulatory regimes. And I believe there is a way through. And the presence of so many regulators and businesses in this room today gives me confidence that we're in a race to the top on data protection. So thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you, Liz. Um, Liz has generously agreed to be available for questions. Uh, just before we do that, can I invite the uh, panelists in the next session to head to the back corner and get mic'd up? Um, I forgot to mention when we began that we have filming uh, the, um, th these are aimed at the speakers only, we're not filming the audience and you won't uh, end up seeing yourself on YouTube, but these will be edited to uh, produce um, uh, material for our online platforms. 10% of the audience on askvote.io privacy forum is there. Is that Mr. Bishop, please come join us at the front. Um, uh, want to know the answer to this question, Liz. Uh, how will EU regulators enforce decisions against NZ organisations? There are various treaties for mutual recognition of foreign judgments, but typically they exclude financial penalties. How will the ICO approach this? Is the question generally around how we're going to enforce overseas, outside of the EU? I think so. How are we going to take that step? Is that, is that yeah, the question? that's the question. So it's not going to be easy. And as I said, we are, 
we are going to be proportionate in taking actions extraterritorially. I think we will, at the end of the day, need to rely on mutual legal assistance treaties and other provisions, and we'll also expect to work with our colleagues in the, in the country, in the domestic um, arena where the complaint is originated. So we had a lot of discussion today about changes in the law, changes in your law, that allows you to share information and collaborate in an enforcement work. And, and that's one of the provisions that's being debated in the New Zealand bill. So it's really important that you can share information with your colleagues around the world for investigations. But I think at the end of the day, we're going to be looking at mutual legal assistance treaties and other legal instruments to enforce the law. I'll take another question from Ask Vote, uh, and then we'll throw it open to the floor for those who don't have access to the technology. Uh, but eight people have uh, voted for the question. There are broad concerns about automation and algorithms. Where does data protection fit among other potential responses to these concerns? I think data protection plays a really large role in um, algorithms right now because in the public sector and in the private sector, algorithms are being used in big data environments that often involves personal data. So we're not necessarily in the midst of robotics and we're not looking at employment regulation as algorithms take over and, and change our workforces. But in terms of algorithms that are making decisions about people's lives in justice, in healthcare, in the commercial sector, in the transportation sector, then data protection plays a really strong role. And the work that we're doing at the ICO is on auditing algorithms, a framework for auditing algorithms, and also on guidelines for algorithm explainability. Thank you. Well, do we have any uh, requests for the microphone from the floor? Any questions? We've got a couple of roving mics. There are people behind, so don't be shy. Uh, ah, Andrew Long. Thank you, John. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, my question for you, from a business standpoint, from a business that has, is based in New Zealand but has UK, uh, EU customers, is a rep uh, representative always necessary for a New Zealand business with EU customers? It's, it's not always necessary. You are directing services to EU residences, re residents, directing services there. Well, a, a proportion of our customers are based in the EU. Are we, we direct and, everywhere. And which um, the majority of your customers are based in what member state? Australia. Okay, but in the EU, which member London. state? Ah, England. England. UK, yeah. So it's useful to have a representative if you have a lot of commerce directed to EU residents because that representative will be able to interact with the ICO in your case and also to assist you in some of the same ways that a data protection officer would assist you. Yeah, I think one of the concerns that I heard with a representative is that they may or may not be directly liable for any non-compliance that may occur. There's debate so about pe that. people get nervous. Yeah, there's, a, there's debate about that, and there's debate about whether or not you want a law firm to take on the role of a, a representative, and I can certainly talk to you offline about some of that detail. Will the UK apply for an adequacy decision of the, EU, uh, of the EU after the Brexit? If the withdrawal agreement makes its way and is approved by Parliament next week, then the UK and the EU have agreed on an expedited adequacy process. So if that agreement is passed, if the agreement isn't passed and it comes to March 29th, 2019, with no agreement, then the UK instantly becomes a third country and there's no guarantee of an expedited process. So we would be in a queue with other countries looking at adequacy. And with 70% of data flows um, coming out of the, going back and forth between the EU and the UK, I think it's, it's really important that, that we have a, an adequacy agreement. 
I think we can take one more question, and then we're going to um, thank Liz and move on to our next panel uh, in the front here. Hello, Julie Hege from Transparency International New Zealand. Uh, it was a great um, presentation. One question I was asking, I uh, wanted to know, was about the work that you're doing around Cambridge Analytica. It's really about the learnings from that and how that's going to inf how those learnings are there going to influence policy across the world, I think, in terms of the way people behave, uh, the way political um, pressure groups and uh, governments behave. What is, are you starting to get those learnings? Where are you heading with that? We've, we've issued two investigation reports and also a policy report that's called Democracy Disrupted. And there are learnings in that report and there are policy recommendations that I think could be relevant to other jurisdictions. We've, we're also working on a lessons learned document because I think the scale of this investigation is unprecedented. The international reach of it is unprecedented and concerns about electoral interference and controlling the personal information, the micro-targeting in the context of elections is something that, that parliamentarians are talking about around the world. So we'll continue our investigation and continue to report out on it over the next year. So as I said, we have a, a treasure trove of data that we're working our way through. Liz, uh, your presentation, your speech was perfectly pitched. Uh, I think you read the audience uh, expertly, and the, one of the ways I can tell that is that you answered questions that were popping up on the ask vote uh, before we got a chance to answer them, okay. uh, to ask you them. So um, thank you so much. If you didn't get a chance to ask your question of Commissioner Denham, uh, don't fret. Her deputy will be on the next panel. There are many GDPR experts uh, that will be speaking to you this afternoon. Uh, there is a question. Um, I shall leave that for the next panel, but join me in thanking Elizabeth Denham for her excellent presentation. <laughs>